Welcome to the Setfos PV simulation workshop. Um, this is focused on PV applications. Try, we would try to show you uh, what you can do with this simulation software Setfos, which includes optical model for light absorption, then also drift diffusion, which is for the electron hole transport uh, to simulation. And advanced optics in this context means we can also do uh, light scattering and not just thin film optics. Uh, there are some colleagues who have uh, worked a lot on this part of the Setfos model, especially Stefan Altesa and Lydia. Lydia, uh, she's uh, actually implementing uh, this m optics model in the code. And um, we have other colleagues that also uh, contribute to, uh, for instance, drift diffusion modeling. Uh, the we have split, well, what we're going to do is first I show you some slides about some background, what's the physical model inside Zephos, what can you do with it, some, ex some examples. And then we have two short, yeah, we have two uh, breaks where Sandra uh, will help also to demonstrate the software uh, live, uh, step by step on the screen. And you should also, are they already Participants have already taken some handouts for uh, showing the list of examples we want to go through. So for PV, ob obviously, physically, it starts with light absorption. So we also start with this topic here in the list of contents. Light absorption is uh, the first thing. Then light scattering is also relevant for increasing the light path in the solar cell to have more chances for light absorption. And the il illustration on the right shows, uh, I think it's a random edge silicon wafer where you see some rendering of the rays that uh, traverse this interface. Then in the electrical part of the modeling, we look, uh, we just pick a few examples uh, to show. So, uh, you can do a lot with electrical modeling, um, DC, AC, and transient, but we pick four examples. One is an uh, optoelectronic simulation of e spectral EQE. So not just l simulating the layer absorbance spectra, but fully coupling optical and electrical and uh, normalizing in a proper way so that then we can compare with the s optical absorption spectra. Uh, sea lift transients, that's a popular method. We can also simulate and then uh, you can compare with the measured data. And for tandem cells, uh, I think I mentioned yesterday that we have electrical model for uh, tandem cells. And finally, mixed ionic electronic perovskite solar cells uh, means that we in the model we have to consider both uh, ionic and electronic charge transport. So the optics starts with light absorption. Here we have a simulation example of an organic solar cell, which is very uh, thin. Uh, you see that the glass, okay, the glass layer would be thick. That then comes the ITO, about 130 nanometers, then the P dot, and then the active layer, P3HT, PCBM, that's the bulk heterojunction. And then the end, there is the rear electrode uh, also shown. So what we do, we have an electromagnetic uh, wave propagation, and uh, we plot on the upper part, we plot the uh, field square, so the light intensity for each given wavelength. And then this light penetration is then uh, also um, convoluted with the AM 1.5 sun spectrum, and in the end, uh, yeah, convoluted, integrated over the lambda, and then we can plot uh, absorbed photons per second per area and per um, nanometer. So this is the first step. So, And then if we would go on, then we could uh, also, from this number of photons, you could then convert this to number of charge carriers. If you assume 100%, then that gives you an idea of the maximum photocurrent you could expect from that flux of photons that is absorbed here. And in this example, the aluminum has significant uh, parasitic absorption, but the main part is absorbed in the um, bulk heterojunction. Another example uh, was also shown here. And so that's the profile of photon generation. 
And you already noticed that we can also uh, name this quantity charge generation rate, or we because this charge generation rate can later be reused in the electrical model. In the electrical model, we have a cross section um, of the device. So this is a source term in the electrical model then, uh, where the carriers are um, generated. And carrier generation can be either direct uh, photon to carrier conversion, or we can assume excitons to be generated. In the organic semiconductors, excitons are long-lived. And th so if you want to consider that, then the excitons diffuse and decay into free carriers before they are extracted. Um, in addition, we have layer absorbances. Uh, so these are the absorbances. Of course, you can also plot the reflectance spectra and transmission spectra. And the total absorption, this red line, is the sum of all the absorbances of the layers available here. And in this example, we have mainly just two layers contributing. The bulk junction, that's the main part of the absorption, and the aluminum that just basically absorbs where the bulk junction does not absorb. Um, that's just a simulation example. And for because in organic solar cells this is thin film optics, meaning that we do have a lot of interference, and so if you vary the thickness of the active layer, if you have a very thin solar cell, 20 nanometers, will have this red absorption spectrum, but if you increase the thickness, then you draw the absorption that you want for a more efficient organic solar cell. And Imagine you can convolute this absorption spectrum with a sun spectrum and then get this theoretically achievable maximum photocurrent and plot it as the same as a function of the active layer thickness. So this is consistent data here, spectral, and here integrated as a photocurrent. And you see, as expected, uh, the bare lambert law would I tell you that you expect an asymptotic uh, approach to a maximum photocurrent for an infinitely thick absorber layer. But it on top of this asymptotic behavior, we have this modulation. And this modulation here, th this oscillation, is due to the thin film interference. Uh, but a realistic organic solar cell has a different thickness dependence. This is uh, actually some work we did a long time ago uh, where we looked at organic solar cells fabricated at TU Eindhoven and they have measured uh, fabricated solar cells with various thicknesses all the way from 40, 15, uh, sorry, 25 nanometers to 150 nanometers and you see if you compare this behavior so we have a first maximum and a minimum. So it looks very similar to here, yeah, the same kind of modulation. The first maximum is typically expected at uh, about 80 uh, nanometers. So in the experiment, yes, you do get this first maximum. Uh, but then in the experiment, there is no, not such a slow increase. There's, it starts to flatten out much earlier. So the optically, you could expect a further increase, but in reality, the photocurrent uh, levels off, and that's due to uh, internal losses, in electrical losses in the, in the solar cell. So there is an internal quantum efficiency that limits the photocurrent uh, that you can achieve here. And due to this observation, uh, that was the motivation to also do electrical modeling, not just optical. So we would uh, consider excitons being generated and being dissociated with a certain mechanism on Sager-Brown mechanism and that will then uh, give us this simulation result. This red line is a simulation result of an optoelectronic model where in contrast to this, this result was just optical calculation but this result is a coupled optoelectronic simulation which includes the exciton generation, dissociation and charge extraction processes. And um, along the line here, uh, the optoelectronic simulation um, can also be used spectrally. So you can um, define an outer loop, um, kind of yeah, sweep the wavelengths, and for each wavelength, do this monochromatic simulation uh, to get a photocurrent versus wavelength. And then Zephyrus will um, normalize it to get the 
quantum external quantum efficiency, which is this red line. And for this particular organic solar cell, you see that uh, optically you would expect this green uh, photocurrent spectrum as a maximum photocurrent or, or EQE maximum. But in reality or in this simulation, due to the electrical uh, losses, there is a gap between optical and electrical simulation here due to internal losses. And now we continue with optics. So then some years back, we also started to simulate um, an amorphous silicon solar cells. And from we had a collaboration with the PV lab in Neuchâtel, where they fabricated solar cells on glass with a zinc oxide layer that is um, etched to have, yeah, has a very rough interface here. And then the cell itself is one micron thick and uh, another yeah, zinc oxide layer and back reflector. And uh, Thomas Lanz, who did the modeling back then, he introduced a new um, thin film optics model that allows for non-planar interfaces. So having interfaces that uh, scatter light as sketched here. And in the experiment from uh, Neuchâtel, uh, they typically can observe the following. So if you take a planar device, if you polish the zinc oxide here, um, then you would get the EQE shown in red. And you see there's a lot of interference fringes because this is still thin enough that uh, there is some interference in the, in the stack. And these little wiggles, they are reproduced by the simulation in a thin film optics calculation. But then if we introduce scattering here, we can enhance, we can broaden the EQE. The so measurement is the dashed blue line here. And the simulation also shows that in the, in the model, we now also kind of get rid of the interference fringes and uh, get more broad uh, EQE. So this is the when we started to do light scattering modeling, and which, which led to um, this new software that um, yeah can consider any sequence of layers, whether the layer is coherent, very thin, or whether the layer is very thick. And between two incoherent layers, we can introduce scattering, and we can even introduce a light source that is diffuse. So usually AM15 is, uh, is collimated light, right? It's uh, parallel light rays. But thanks to this new optical model, we can also simulate what would happen if the light source is a diffuse source, meaning that from all different angles, we have illumination onto the solar cell. And it turns out for this demo example that the uh, EQE is uh, the shape of the EQ of the absorbance spectrum is affected by diffuse rather than collimated light. And on the bottom right, you see that th these most of these examples are taken from the tutorial database. There is a database of examples where you can um, open uh, these examples. And another um, recently more interesting solar cell structure is the tandem structure where you have a thick wafer, so this silicon wafer here is 200 mi 280 microns thick, uh, very, very thick, so this image is not to scale, so we usually just draw the thick layers with this uh, white bracket, uh, bra uh, white line there. The ah, yeah, that's good, yeah. <laughs> and the, you see that the other layers are nanometer sized, but there's one thick uh, wafer substrate. And then on top with the sec that front cell is the perovskite solar cell that absorbs and it has a 300 nanometer thickness. And there are lots of layers. And this the light spectrum from the sun is illustrated here. So we can calculate the energy flux versus wavelengths, how it penetrates in all into all these layers. And instead of doing an Z position in real dimension, we just plot it versus relative position. So we just count the interfaces. The first interface is uh, the one here, air ITO. Um, yeah, and then the second is the, the next interface and so on. So this is how you can identify the layer by relative position. And this 
between interface four and five, that's where we have the first absorber, that's the perovskite layer, which absorbs the short wavelength part of sunlight, and the long wavelength part is penetrating further down into the silicon wafer where you see that the longer the wavelength, the further we have penetration of light into the silicon wafer. And in this example, it's all the interfaces are planar. So that's the simple case. Uh, but I think uh, from PV lab we learned that flat, uh, polished wafers uh, yeah, would need to be used to have or, or non-edged non wafers, I guess, for planar um, interfaces. But now the question was, um, how can this structure be improved? And Björn Nissen was giving a nice presentation on Tuesday evening. He explained all the motivation for these uh, tandem structures and how to in improve this situation. And we have a joint publication that was mentioned on Tuesday as well. Uh, this publication in Optics Express uh, appeared recently where we have compared our simulation results to measurements uh, to the real data from the lab in Neuchâtel. And the structure A would be a planar stack. Structure B would have a front anti-reflection coating. Structure C has a rear texture on the wafer. And what we observe is that going from A to B, you see that uh, the EQE uh, of both front and bottom cell are increased because this structured foil acts as anti-reflection foil. And you see that symbols are the measurements and the lines are the simulations. And you see that it's quite well reproduced by the simulation even for this uh, property of the structured foil. So we can actually measure the topography of any film and import the topography. Uh, AFM image or any other topography measurement can be imported into Cetfos and Cetfos will consider this light scattering at this interface. And of course you also see the, the measured and the simulated uh, subcell currents and uh, you see it in the according to simulation and, and also it's, it's not always matched so the currents are not uh, always matched but that's an optimization target to to match the currents and in the last structure c the absorption of the silicon cell uh, is here there's the reference and here is the structure c you can see that the long wavelength absorption is enhanced thanks to this rear uh, scattering and now there's further optimization. So after having confidence that the optical model is reliable, we can start playing around with the device parameters to increase the photo current, the expected photo current, and the layer absorbance. So this kind of plot is, we call it stacked contributions in Cetfos. Um this this yeah, stacked contribution is just adding up all the contributions to the absorbance versus wavelengths and you see the perovskite and crystalline silicon absorption there's still a strong reflection here the green contribution that's just a reflected light uh, that's bad and in this structure here we also have uh, spiral omitted here in the front which has some parasitic absorbance uh, that can be noticed uh, in this brown area here and also on, on that side. And then flipping the NIP uh, to PIN sequence, then we get rid of the spiromethod um, absorption. And now the absorption in the silicon is much more enhanced and very little r reflectance is left. And this is uh, kind of yeah, we could say this kind of a hero structure is <laughs> seems to be uh, a good structure and uh, uh, PV Lab also managed to actually um, fabricate such kind of a structure where all the thin film perovskite layers are conformally deposited on top of the textured silicon wafer, which is uh, a challenge in its own. And the question is here, of course, to how can you make sure that the currents are matched here. So um, afterwards in the exercises there are some examples uh, in this context 
where you can go through. And I think the way we proceed is um, w we have, I have a few, yeah, tells me this is slide 14 and that there are f five slides left. So in the next five slides, I'll show you some examples of electrical modeling. And afterwards, we can do the hands-on exercises on the computer. Just to give you an idea that you can do more than uh, optical modeling. So in ZFOS, we have yeah, optical modeling, so light in coupling, that's the blue stuff. And uh, I, show, I have shown you this blue, this generation profile, or yeah, that's photon absorption profile that I have shown in a previous graph, can be coupled either to the exciton continuity equation or to the charge continuity equation. So uh, in the simple case, we just assume photon to carrier conversion, hun full co uh, fully directly converge, uh, convert. So that's the position dependent absorption profile, small g of x. And it, there's a prefactor which the user can choose how many, uh, how what's the percentage of uh, photons actually converted to carriers. That's the simple way of coupling optics and electrical. And the more advanced way is to consider the, um, that the, op the photons are a source term for the exciton continuity equation. Um, that's if you want to consider bulk ladder junction OPV where Onsager round dissociation um, happens. And so let's go to a very popular measurement technique where the voltage transient, so basically it's this photosilic experiment. Um, you go to a, first of all, a, yeah, you would start out at uh, VOC, for instance, and then um, have an illumination. So this is the voltage transient. On the first 20 microseconds, we have this constant voltage, but we also apply a light pulse for the first 15 microseconds. And this light pulse will generate charge carriers in the solar cell. And these charge carriers are then extracted by a voltage ramp going into the negative direction. And uh, during this voltage ramp, we will expect a, a displacement current, so kind of a constant current. And this is shown down here. So this is simulation, this is not measurement. So you've seen yesterday, Martin showed you PIOS measurements. In the measurement, you would only measure the red line here. And uh, it's confusing. Now here we plot the current, it's a negative current. We go to the JV curve, the illuminated JV curve. You have a negative current, right? So Zephos will output it this way. And you see the little bump there. That's the sea leaf peak that uh, shows when are the carriers uh, reaching the electrode and being extracted. Uh, when are the charges extracted? And but there's more information from the simulation. You uh, it will also show you the um, the recombination happens during the light light illumination, and there's a little time window. Oh. In photosilly, if you vary the delay time between light and uh, voltage ramp, li light pulse and voltage ramp, and during this time window, um, we also have something going on. You see a little bit of current, which in in advanced techniques, you can suppress this current by uh, applying a non-constant voltage in this time window here. So that's kind of an O-trace technique. And in simulation software here, you could also um, yeah, not just assume a constant voltage, but choose a voltage that will make sure the there is no carrier recombination or no um, current flowing there. OK, but you see the electrons and holes. So this was a, is actually an artificial example where we chose electron hole mobility to be slightly different. And you notice that even th there are two peaks. So there's a main peak and there's an additional peak. And they simply correspond to the electron extraction in green and the hole extraction in blue. So this, um, and yeah, most of the times you measure just one peak, but in theory you would also see some second peak. Uh, so that's that's uh, magnifying the the curve that you could measure, and uh, yeah, these are the two times t max one t max two. That's the set for the example. Sealive dot par is the name of this example that you can look at afterwards. And then we have, of course, we can do a steady state simulation to get current voltage curves, but um, and also impedance 
calculations. For instance, for capacitance frequency, capacitance voltage curves, and there has been some nice work also, for instance, in OPV, if you do photo uh, degradation, photo bleaching, you can generate um, dopants, and the dopants will lead to a capacitance increase. So there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do with impedance spectroscopy on solar cells. Um, so, but here I'm showing a, a m even more exotic example where, no, not so exotic, it's actually a common technique in the dye-sensitized solar cell community, namely an intensity modulated photocurrent spectroscopy technique um, where the light is modulated periodically and then the photocurrent is uh, measured and here uh, we actually simulated this by varying the frequency and then plotting the AC modulation that you get in the current. And this uh, particular peak that appears here is usually used to, yeah, to study this. Uh, um, it's the rec sorry. Charge yeah, it is the peak position is highly linked to the charge carrier mobility in the device. Um, yeah, and as you can see here, we divided the mobility value by 100, and then everything slowed down to lower frequencies in this peak. And the uh, final uh, comment is about uh, ionic transport in the perovskite solar cells, where you do, where we believe in perovskite solar cells, as you heard this morning from Pierce Barnes, for instance, there, there are these uh, ions in the active layer, and in the software we can define a fixed number of ions being present in the layer and they cannot go out of the layer, they are just uh, contained in the active layer, but they can redistribute according to the local electric field avail uh, available. And there's different ways how to use this model, either to um, make a preconditioning calculation that kind of um, yeah, makes a good well-defined state before you do the transient measurement or before you, uh, transient characterization or AC characterization. So it's a user choice uh, how to do the modeling. First do a pre-calculation and then uh, maybe fixing the, the charge carriers. That's one option. F meaning fixing them and importing them um, basically as, uh, as dopants in fixed in space and then do the next simulation only with the mobile carriers. That's one way, but an alternative is to do fully coupled ionic electronic simulation uh, so that all the carriers can move during the simulation time and they can interact directly with each other. Of course, the ions have an other time scale than the free carriers, and that means that uh, you have to simulate very long in the transient case. And this kind of model is also useful for electrochemical, uh, light emitting electrochemical cells that were presented this morning at the conference. We have some results using this model for uh, organic light emitting electrochemical cells where you see how the PIN junction forms in the, in the layer. Um, so the another example also taken from the tutorial of the software is this uh, perovskite JV and the no a second one, full perovskite JV. <laughs> there are two examples. Um, in this example, you see a simulation of the JV curve for three different uh, ways of preconditioning. Um, but Sandra will show this afterwards in the, in the exercise sessions. You see that the fill factor changes depending on the preconditioning and of course, as mentioned down here, please make sure that the m choice of model reflects the experimental condition. There are different ways to measure your device and the model should also be consistent with the choices in the experiments. Uh, so that was a quick overview on uh, modeling optically and electrically solar cells. Um, thank you for your attention and um, before we move on to hands-on exercises, uh, I'm happy to take questions about uh, the model implemented. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a technical point, I don't know. I, well, maybe it's interesting to people. So, 
La light emitting electrochemical cells. Olex. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. at the uh, electrode uh, layer interface. Um, in that case, we do not have a tunneling m injection model. So the, the dopants or the ions, they just pile up at the side. Uh, and the it's only the electrons holes which can uh, be injected and or extracted. Yeah, in, in a injected through uh, potential uh, to across a barrier, if there's a barrier. But if the... Yeah, you choose either a thermal uh, injection or a ohmic contact where if you fix the uh, density. Okay. And yeah, so there are some uh, choices of which injection model to use in ZFOS. And unfortunately, not all the physical options are available in all solvers. So in ZFOS, we have <laughs> a DC transient and AC solver. And especially if you AC solver is quite an uh, advanced thing, and there we didn't uh, update all the physical models. So it could happen that some injection models are available in the DC and the transient solver, but not uh, yet in the AC. But we are in progress of improving that. <laughs> more okay. If there are no more questions, uh, we could. Well, so we switch the laptop. Yeah. How much is this now? Monique gestellt. It's it's gone. That's a move. Well, guys. Did you did you manage to install Setfos and open it? Okay. No complaint. So sorry. So we more or less just go through the hands-on and I try to show you a bit the tricks and conventions and where to find what. Um, to just interrupt me if you cannot follow if there is a question. Um, so this is the, the main window that you see when you open ZFOS. And there are uh, these four modules, um, absorption, drift diffusion, emission and scattering. And you just need to select them if you want to use them, kind of. Um, so I already started with another one. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to design a, a, a solar cell, an OPV. And what you need to do is just to, from this basic one, you just add some layers. So here is a button of adding layers. You can also delete them. And then just uh, reproduce this stack. So we just need to call the first layer air top, um, set the refractive index to 1, the next layer would be glass, set it to 1.5, and then for the more complex materials we use uh, NK files, so you can access it by clicking on this folder here uh, and look for ITU. Uh, the same is true for p dot. And there's a bulk, uh, I would suggest. I think there is P3HD, PCBM, yes. And uh, oh yeah, aluminium as well. So as per convention, ZFOS always considers light coming from the top. So uh, that's why we designed here the, the stack like this. So the top layer is air, um, kind of natural. Ah, yes, and then we need to enable the absorption module, of course. Then we can look at the illumination spectrum. This is shown here. If you click on this magnification lens, the glass, then you see um, the spectrum of sunlight. So here you could also let load any other file, like an LED or 
whatever you you like to use. And uh, one thing about the um, NK file, so to look at this NK file, you can go in this arrow here, and then you see what kind of um, NK file we use. Here you can also easily click through the layers, by the way, that's also. Yeah. And for glass, yes, I would set it to incoherent. Okay, that's, I think, everything. So then you can already start and run the simulation. Oui. So make a long time computer. <laughs> So wh what do you want to see? Um, for example, this is the absorption profile uh, that Bert already showed. Um, then you can also look at the absorbance, the layer absorbance, so every, every layer individually, the reflectance, the transmittance, and also the stacked contributions. And then there are also some, some key figures like, um, uh, where is it, um, the maximum photocurrent that could be generated by the bulk in this example if every charge would be converted into, uh, if every photon would be converted into charge and extracted, there will be 10 milliamps per square centimeter. And there's also an ink coupling efficiency for 14.9% uh, here is the conversion from Sunlight to current in this layer. So each layer has a maximum photocurrent and a optical efficiency, how, how much fraction of light is absorbed in this layer. Okay. Um, as the next thing, we could uh, look at my thickness variation. So there is some something kind of <coughs> like a sweep. So we need to enable this uh, wizard here. And then go to simulation settings, sweep settings, or on alternatively control W. And then we want to vary the thickness of the layer. So you can go here to the layer. Oops. Uh, want to vary the thickness of the bulk. Was this your or uh, it's yours. Ah, okay. <laughs> There is also a, it also recognizes what you want to do sometimes. So if you sh just write bulk, then can select it from the drop time. So D is uh, nomenclature for thickness. And then we're just going to vary it from 20 to 200, maybe 60 nanometers in steps of 20. Macht es dann nicht einfach immer das Maximum? Also. Weiß es nicht. <lacht> okay, then you see this kind of uh, graph. So we did a rough sweep, so uh, but Bert already showed it. So you have this interference effect on top of the envelope. Um, yes? Mm. Any comments on that? <lacht> No. Okay. So we're going to do a tandem as a next step. Uh, so to open a new example from the library, you can go to s open. <coughs> just, just click yes. Then, then it should go to the example folder directly. If not, it's on C, program files, Floxim, Zfos. And then just look for tandem opv dot par. Then it, it loads the, uh, the file directly. Okay, there is, uh, so you can see that we have two, here the layer stack defined, we have two uh, solar cells, and in this example, there is a sweep of uh, the first cell thickness and the second cell thickness. And now we just want to look at the, 
at the um, current matching point, so to find this by varying the thickness. Um, one thing you should do is in these output settings, should uh, enable the HTML report. This is usually disabled to speed up some uh, exporting of data. And if we now enable it, we can have a look at more graphs later on. Yes. HTML report. <laughs> Im, uh, oh, no. Yes. Yeah. Here, so is the third wizard. Hopefully, it works. Yes. So, there are all the output settings basically, and the interesting graph is here. So, you have a variation of the second cell and the first cell, and this intersection line here uh, gives you current matching points, and now you, you would just need to look at the current and see where it's maximum. This would be a manual kind of optimization. And uh, if you want to do this automatically, and not this one, then you can also use the optimize function. So instead of using the sweep, we use optimize. Mm. And we add some parameters. So we add first cell thickness and second cell thickness. We need to give an uh, initial value and, and some boundaries. And then in the second um, selection here, targets, this would be a scatter target. Okay, so we can only optimize one at once. At okay. Okay, so we in this console output actually you see that the optimization was reached after 38 iterations and then you get the, the two thicknesses of the cells, but we only maximize for the second cell, so we would need to maximize also for the first cell. And in the results, well, this is also shown. You see here the, the thicknesses. And yeah, I think the rest is not so interesting. We could now check whether it matches. Yeah, approximately. Yeah. <laughs> ah, then yeah. Well, okay. If you maximize for the second cell, it will look for uh, for this maximum, obviously, and not for for the current matching. Okay. Uh, 
Um, the other example would be um, the tandem perovskite that Beat already showed. So we, we will do three simulations here um, with, with, with structuring or not. So the first thing would be a flat one. Um, it's called tandem perovskite silicon. So I'm going to open this one. So you here you see again the layers. Uh, we put some, so some of them are incoherent, like this crystalline silicon and the glass. And there is a sweep defined, which just varies the, the perovskite thickness. So and then uh, here you could in principle do this uh, current matching manually. So you see here the the current um, of the perovskite is increasing with thickness. Uh, at the same time, there is an, a decrease of the of the silicon current, and here would be the current matching point uh, for a fixed uh, silicon thickness. Okay. Yes. Um, and if we disable the sweep just for the next simulation, we just um, have this one um, thickness example. And I want to show you how the stacked contributions look like in the simulation. So we are going, going to look at this plot here. And yeah, here you would see some, some losses, um, like because of non-structured non interfaces and I think there is not well there is no spiral here in this basic example but yeah So we're going to look at these examples if we now further increase the complexity by structuring the interface So the next one uh, would be tandem perro SE rear texture <laughs> Okay, um, so you see that it's the model or the, the layer structure is uh, much more complex already. And that here at the back of the silicon, we have this uh, structured interface. So um, this is actually, hmm? ah, uh, sorry, here on the arrow on the right hand side of the interface. So here we imported a file that we actually got from from PV Lab, and you can look at this file, and this is this is the texture. Going to use, um, yeah, to speed up, um, just uncheck this non-random seat. Um, it's used for uh, for uh, 3D ray tracing. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's also a choice how accurate do you want the result um, yes, in I the optical <laughs> modeling here. You can choose the discretization of angles, so you can choose the number of rays, uh, I mean, yes, or segments. Here we have uh, all every two degrees, so that's very accurate, it takes a bit longer. If we would have reduced the number of rays to 45 instead of, uh, I don't know, reduced to 30 instead of 45, then it would also be a bit faster, but the angular resolution is then a bit worse. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> I think this is a um, more realistic uh, tandem structure. I mean, in terms of the layers involved, and this black, what is the black? That's the re that's reflection the part. Yeah. And yeah, it's a really strong reflecting, so it's not very efficient <laughs> tandem. <laughs> but well, uh, one thing we can try is um, so to keep um. the results, uh, we are going to use the trick of opening in a, in a new GUI. So there is file, uh, open in new GUI. Then there will be an, uh, a second 
um, instance. set instance loaded. And then we can, in this second instance, we can disable this interface. So you can easily disable it by just click on clicking the interface. Then you also need to unclick the scattering module because then it's not used anymore. And then just run it again. Then it's much faster also. <laughs> <laughs> it's the planar structure then. Yes. And then you can compare these stacked contributions in, in, in this one without, um, without texture and width. Yeah. And you see the main difference is in the around 1,000 nanometers of wavelengths. There's this uh, much stronger absorption here uh, uh, for the silicon, thanks to the rear texture. And here in the planar case, the silicon is less absorbing, and overall we have more reflection here. Uh, just um, in, the, in the main window, you have to go to File, uh, Open a New GUI. It just opens a second instance. With the same setting, with the same yeah. example. Yeah. Um, okay, then there is... Uh, I bet the, uh, the, an alternative, if you would go to the layer absorbance plot, instead of having a colorful stack uh, the representation, you can also select layer absorbances, and then you see the same data just as lines. And then you see here this green curve, that's the absorbance of the silicon, and due to the rear texture is much enhanced. And in this plot, you have the option to keep certain lines here in the, the representation, and then also rerun the calculation just in the same session instead of opening a new GUI. That's the alternative to just keep maybe absorption of perovskite and of silicon. Yes. Um, and then we can run the fully textured, I think, right? Ah, or this one or was... This one ah was yeah, just the the rear So there the next example is a front and rear textured solar cell. So this would be... Um, mm. Tandem pero si silicon conform. It's called. No, that's the. No. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. That's another rear texture. Okay. Oh okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the trick is just that we have two interfaces. I think now, right? That uh, reproduce themselves. So, this one. Yeah, it's the same. So you just have two interfaces that are uh, have the same uh, uh, structure here in the right. Oops, you see it. So um, we're gonna what we said before. We just reduce it to thirty. Maybe that to to reduce a bit the time. No, no. <laughs> right. uh, Jeremy Werner, he's a member of the PV Lab, which is uh, at EPFL, a research center in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. They do all the fabrication of these kind of solar cells and have published lots of world-leading results in silicon and perovskite solar cells. But <laughs> and they also have um, investigated uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry of perovskite films um, because this is important input to the simulation like the real and the ref imaginary refractive index dispersion uh, is an important input to this simulation so is that where you get your yes yeah well not in general sorry not in general or <laughs> how do you mean <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> ideally you would get it like yeah. that if you don't have this uh, instrument you have to guess the refractive index <laughs> or you <laughs> could also uh, actually use Zephyrus to extract the refractive index if you feed in some spectra like reflection transmission spectra can be imported and Zephyrus can fit an uh, analytical dispersion model of the layer uh, to reproduce the spectral data you could even import uh, ellipsometry raw data psi delta to to then do the yeah, nk fitting as well inside Zephyrus, yeah uh, but uh, materials like perovskites depending how do you process them the nk looks a bit different <laughs> or maybe and also can be tuned with a band gap I forgot to mention something um, to where you can, so in this interface you need to, if you want to have conformally coated, you need to click this coated interface. So then uh, all coherent layers around this interface will be, um, or all layers around the interface will be considered coherent. So otherwise it will not be uh, conformally coated. That's one thing I wa forgot to mention. Anyway, some time. Um, so optically, uh, so right now we're doing optic simulation. So there it doesn't, we don't need the interface model, but the uh, hopping model. But this hopping model for the um, electrical tandem simulation that's new since version 4.6, we which we released in this earlier this year in yeah. in February, I think. Yeah. I think we could also show this one maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> 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 there is also an, in, uh, an example if you want to have a look. Uh, like, I think it's called. Uh, uh, mm, it's not tandem JV or tandem IV, maybe. Yeah, tandem tandem IV. It's called, yeah. and then you have uh, fully coupled, um, like absorption plus drift diffusion and you have this this uh, hopping interface here in between uh, where you can um, select hopping interface for this model while waiting we can ah yeah just in time <laughs> ah yes so now you see also the the difference between this old just mm, rear textured lines Direct comparison. As a dash line, you see the silicon before, kind of, and this is now with the fully textured, conformally coated. And this one is the difference in, in, in perovskite. Side edge with rear, sorry. The the one with lower absorption is one sided edge, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Ah, both are one side. Yeah. Are this conform? It's, it's uh, conformally coated just now, I think. Perovskite, right? Just have this. But here we have the dashed line on the sketch on the right hand side shows where we have introduced the scattering interface. It's on the front and the uh, rear of the silicon wafer. Well. But uh, you know the thickness is not optimized here. This yeah. is just one thickness combination. If you would, I guess. Okay, um, so as a next thing, uh, we go away from optics and look um, into uh, optoelectronic simulations. So um, the first simulation is called full um, solar cell stack IV, actually. Um, s 
So then you see that there is the absorption and the drift diffusion model module enabled. And now you instead of only having the refractive index defined, you also need to define the electrical material files. And obviously, you just need to define it uh, for the active layer in this case. So um, to look at these material parameter files, we loaded it here from a um, library example. You can go to edit, and then you see all these parameters, like homo lumo, dielectric constant, density of states. And this is the optical generation efficiency. This is the prefactor that Beat mentioned. Um, the mobilities, here we assume constant mobilities. And there would also be something like traps or uh, excitons if you want to couple it to excitons or ions. And then um, you also need to f define the electrode. So here at the bottom, we switch to the drift diffusion tab. And we define the top electrode to be P dot with certain work functions, aluminum with another certain work functions. And in here, you also now have, beside the layer structure, you also have the energy level diagram. Okay, and then additionally, there is a, a sweep. Um, we sweep the voltage just, just to get an IV curve. Um, otherwise, you can just look at one voltage, um, but it's fast, so we can do it. So this would be the IV curve of this curve, of this uh, cell, sorry. And um, so in this currents, and then we have a lot of additional output. So we again have the spectral stuff, like the absorbance, but we now have also electrical profiles. For example, we can look at the band diagram, and we now have this uh, sweep slider here on the right. So you can look at the band diagram at all different voltages that we tested. Yes can also run it as a movie. <laughs> um, similarly, we can look at charge densities and scroll through the different voltages. And of course, um, electric field um, as multi-curve, as checkerboard, or also if you want as a sweep, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, potential recombination, yeah. And and there is also the optics output again. So, but that here, I mean, when you sweep the voltage, there is no change in the in the absorption. That's why it's not so interesting. Ah, and in the in the key figures, you would also have something like a VOC and JSC fill factor and uh, power. Okay, um, anyone interested in C-Lift or not so much? Yeah, let's save a bit of time and do the others. Um, okay, I think we do a spectral EQE and then afterwards I want to show you also the ionic example. Um, so spectral EQE. Um, called solar cell EQ. And it's also fully coupled uh, simulation. We again, uh -huh. yes, normally we have to sweep here. So this is kind of an outer sweep. And to have a photocomb resolved um, output, uh, wavelengths, resolved photocurrent output, that's the word. We need to sweep the wavelengths here in this normal sweep mode. That's, that's the trick, to get an EQE directly simulated. Uh, it's again a uh, normal like solar cell P3HT, PCBM type. And then the EQE would be Uh, yes, um, ah, yeah, optical integrated. So here's the EQ that you could directly compare with uh, with measurements. Okay. Uh, 
And yeah, of course, I mean, if, if you have this electrical module, you can also do other sweeps. You could sweep mobilities, you can sweep um, charge to electron, uh, photon to, to exciton couplings, and um, a lot of other things. I uh, hear this is the magic button uh, where you need to couple uh, the photons to charges or to excitons. <coughs> Okay, the perovskite example, I think it's called full perovskite um, IV. Or yes. So here you see the energy level diagram with three layers. And um, in the perovskite layer, we, know we should also have not only electrons, but no, we don't have traps here. Uh, we don't have ions here. Let me see. Okay, yes, um, sorry, it was the other one. <laughs> so open the uh, perovskite IV, not the full perovskite IV. I think this was uh, the simulation from Martin's paper where he used just fixed uh, doping densities. So, sorry for that. Anyway, um, in the perovskite layer, we now have, um, when you go to this arrow and then to the EM file, to the mobile ions, you see now that we have some anions here and mobile ions are enabled for this layer and we have a certain density of them. Um, so you go to the arrow here. Yeah. <laughs> this will actually be changing in the next version. <laughs> um, then you go to here in this EM tab. We go to edit, ah. then the mobile lines at the bottom. <coughs> and to look at these special settings, so we have here mobile lines enabled in this standard. So this is the um, simulation set or drift diffusion settings, actually, it's called uh, simulation settings, drift diffusion settings. You need to allow these mobile lines. And here you could do this preconditioning that Bert mentioned. So you could uh, fully couple an electron ionic calculation and then freeze in the ions at a certain steady state distribution, like for example here, zero volt, and then do another uh, steady state electronic simulation or transient. And here we sweep again the voltage, right? Yes, to get an IV curve. So this would represent an example where you really slowly measure an IV curve that all the ions and all the electrons can always relax to the steady state distribution. So we keep this uh, J-mean in the current step and we also do the same kind of simulation, um, but now we use a preconditioning of 0 0.9, so this would be a preconditioning forward direction, and then um, do a reverse sweep, kind of a fast scan. Scan direction. No, it, I mean, you never really have a scan direction. You just have to use a preconditioning. Okay. So the ions are static during the light scan. In in this in this newest simulation, yes, they are static at a uh, distribution of 0 0.9 volt. So this would be a reverse scan. Yeah. And a fast compared to the ion mobility. Yeah. And then, yeah. if you would like to do the other thing, like. Uh, the other way around, we would do a preconditioning at minus 0 0.4 and then keep them fixed. And, okay. and this, um, and the brown one would actually be the, the steady state distribution. So really 
until you get a steady state at every voltage point. Um, yes, and then you also have ad additionally to the charge densities or in the charge density plot, actually you have also the ions uh, that are shown here. Uh, anions and cations and you can also sweep them but now we fix them so they are not moving <laughs> but in the other simulation um, I think we can we just take out the preconditioning and quickly run it again um, you can also see how they move during the sweep so in this um, electrical profiles charge densities so at minus voltage, well, negative voltages, the anions are on, on the TATM side, and then you increase the voltage, and then they go to the other side, hopefully. Not really, but the, the number is decreased. Okay. Um, yes, this... I didn't mention, but you can define it here by the number of elements. And by default, it just takes uh, one point per nanometer. Yes, just linear, linear, linear yes yeah. But you could uh, introduce artificial boundary layers where you have more much yeah, yeah. more points, yeah. Yes. And um, so in this example, you um, this is strictly a steady state uh, solution. In in the solver settings, one can choose. I mean, for JV, and one alternative is to use a transient solver, and then kind of say after so many micro or milliseconds, um, stop the simulation, and then just take that as a pseudo steady state, and then that would maybe. In principle, that <laughs> should work. But early, at least in the early days when we didn't have a steady state, steady state solver, we would always use transient simulation until reaching steady state and ta take that as a steady state. But in the meantime, we have this much faster uh, steady state solver. Yeah. Yeah. I'd still be the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and but it can also be interesting. Yeah, if you start with a good uh, initial distribution, then you would, yeah, I guess you get yeah. to the, uh, yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's, can you ask one more question? yeah, sure. Yeah, and looking back, it was a stupid choice, probably, <laughs> especially. In case we come up with a battery model, then <laughs> we, we have a lack of icons. <laughs> so, but, but why is it next to two layers and not the other? That's the question. Uh -huh. um, so this just indicates that we have the, the electrode that is on this layer. Oh, I see that. So uh, if I would choose ITO, it jumps up there. They form the boundaries then. Those yes, exactly. Yeah. You see it in the energy level diagram. Yeah. yeah. So optically, the complete stack is considered, and electrically, it's a sub-stack that is used. Yeah. OK. I, I um, think I'm or, or the tandem, JV? Or do you had it open before, or no? Or, or tandem was IV. Or was it? Ah, for the hopping. Uh, is this a? Yeah, tandem IV. Much to the side. Aha. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, just before we mentioned already this tandem uh, electrical model. So now we have this would be the um, this very basic example that's that Stefan did for for validating the model. So you have uh, two times the same polymer, kind of, and uh, in between two layers and in at this interface you have this um, special hopping interface which is shown here and the thing you have to define is a, a free a attempt frequency of hopping this is um, defined here
and um, yeah, all the other things are the same. So you have uh, material files for all the ac like active layers or the ones between the battery symbol. <laughs> Yes, and then you see uh, also like this charge density that Bea already showed yesterday um, as a function of voltage. And um, where is, yes, the band diagram. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah That's why uh, you get that. a. I yeah. Patricio's presentation was really good. But really interesting because it's, yeah, it's something that I guess we have to think about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's more complicated than I first imagined. I realized when you present it, yeah. It's not, not trivial to implement the different. The quasi Fermi level was crossing the <laughs> Homo Lumo there, so that <laughs> means that it exceeds the total density of states. Uh, yeah. the which but yes, we are also working on this. So we, for instance, a similar large densities can then also occur at. Uh, uh, electrodes if for the ions, anion and cation, can be huge numbers, and um, there's no upper limit basically if you use this Boltzmann yes. law. And so, so. not so easy to force something, <laughs> All right? But but we could, yeah, we are working on, um, yeah, limiting the ion density and using Fermi Dirac statistics so that yeah. it's just once it's full, it's full, the, yeah. the density of state, yeah. yeah. And and then you end up with uh, slightly different profiles of ions, yeah. So they will be more penetrating into the bulk rather than piling up. And uh, we thought that we would uh, improve the issues with conversions and so on, but <laughs> the rea we realized uh, yeah, you get a physically more meaningful picture, but they're still numerically challenging to solve. Uh. Yes. But in this version 4.6, uh, it's not in yet. So we released uh, ionic charge transport and electronic charge transport, but still with the Boltzmann statistics so far. But next version probably <laughs> has a choice of statistics, probably. Yeah. Ah. Okay. okay, I think uh, we are pretty much at the end here. but. Uh, are happy to answer questions or open uh, other examples of interest <laughs> because there's tons of examples in the database. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a light emitting uh, Cell?
we, I mean, we, ha we have an example, but it's not here in the database. So. Sure. There is a transient P uh, perovskite example if you want to run it. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. But it and takes a bit of time, that's why I didn't show yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pulsed, uh, voltage pulse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> 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 Those examples uh, were not shown <laughs> here. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> there are some tweaks to play around with solver parameters to make it converge better some damping coefficients yeah. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes customers say, ah, it doesn't work, and then our yeah, internal support will suggest or try out other settings. Yeah. Use some damping here, but, well, uh, it's not shown here, huh? but I'm not sure if there is a, a reasonable way how to define these numbers. It's always a bit tr playing around it. See how it works. <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention. This concludes the PV simulation demo hands-on session. And um, we could continue now yeah, with um, OLED simulation. Uh, for those who are interested in <laughs> OLED simulation, are welcome to stay. And in OLED simulation, yeah, there's we have even more possible physical model choices and examples. And um, I would propose that I will start with a presentation about electrical and optical modeling of OLEDs.